Welcome to The Cherry Picker, the horror movie podcast where we like to kill people, but not really. I'm your host, Zach Cherry, and with me, as always, is... Eddie of Edward is Truth. And joining us as a special guest, uh, returning from his last appearance when we did uh, Scream 6, is... Andre. Yay! Yay. Yay. Hail hail Payman! (laughs) Hail Payman! Uh, And uh, Andre is, uh, for anyone who's just joining uh, and did not listen to the last uh, podcast, Andre is our editor. He's the official Cherry Picker editor. And uh, when he came on to do the Scream 6 podcast, he scored even higher than both of us. I don't know where I got that like score or numbers from, but but uh, people seem to respond a lot more positively to him than, than either of us. So, so we're announcing that I'm taking over the cherry picker. Yeah. If if any of us, you know, succumbs to an, an illness or, you know, gets our head decapitated by a, a phone pole um like you do you know who's going to be replacing uh that person uh, but wow. but anyway um we we had to have andre back because it was a lot of fun the last time we did uh uh all three of us together and the movie for today which um my memory sucks but i i believe you right this was your pick right andre yeah, you after Scream Six, you said you know I was welcome to come back on any time, which is thank you again for having me. Um, and I, it was a quick decision. I was like, you know what, I would love to do since you hadn't done it already. I would love to do Hereditary because I love Ari Aster. Well, most of Ari Aster. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for inviting me on again. Yeah, and thank you for choosing Hereditary. Um, and. Uh, actually, this is I, I planned it for this date because this was released June eighth, two thousand and eighteen, and that is the this is like the fifth anniversary, which is every time we do this, and we're just like this movie's five, ten, twenty years old. That's crazy to think mm-hmm. that you know COVID years you just like went by like a flash. So here we are, hereditary, five years later. Um, <laughs> yeah. Eddie, do you want to start us off with this uh, premise? Yeah, let's get that out of the way. Yeah. Okay. When Annie Graham loses her already estranged mother, Ellen Lee, unsettling occurrences and palpable spiritual manifestations start nestling in her secluded house's dark corners. But... After Annie's family suffers an additional, even more shocking loss, a thick veil of grief and guilt slowly begins to shroud their every waking moment, leading them to a seemingly inescapable fate that could be somehow hereditary. Um, so Andre, since you, you kind of already mentioned, uh, Ari Aster and being a huge fan of most of his career, do you want to just elaborate <laughs> on that and we can get the, that out of the way first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Um, yeah. so obviously I loved, uh, Hereditary. And actually the first time I saw it, I saw it in theaters by myself when it came out. Um, and it was actually the first time I had gone to the theater alone. It was, I don't know, just happened to be that way. And it was just a really good experience. So I fell in love with Hereditary. And then when Midsummer came out, or Midsummer, however you pronounce it, um, fell in love with that one. So two for two, I was just all about Ari Aster. And then obviously, um, Bo is Afraid came out recently. And I went and saw that as well in theater. <laughs> I've heard. I haven't seen it yet myself, but I've heard I'm tell. Too. Yeah, I won't spoil anything, but um, right. it's definitely, and I, you know, I went in knowing it wasn't going to be like Hereditary or Midsommar. Right. I, you know, because I had read that it was going to be like a dark comedy or something of that nature. And I was just excited to see more Ari Aster, to be honest. It was, it didn't have to be like a straight up horror film. Mm. And I just, you know, to keep it polite, 
I was disappointed. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> what about you, Zach? Yeah, I agree. I, I did see Bo's Afraid. And um, there's definitely, there's moments where I was getting Hereditary and Midsommar, um, but there were so few and far between. And uh, I mean, this is a three hour movie. And with the type of like self-indulgent storytelling and directing that was going on there, it's just like, you know, when I'm required to sit in a movie for that long, I need something to, to kind of like trail me along um, to make that time worth it. To, so, so it doesn't feel like it's three hours long. And everything that he did in that movie emphasized the, the, the uh, length of it that it made it seem even longer. That by the time I got out, it, it felt like I was in the, the theater for five hours and it, I did not have a good time. And I, I will never watch it again and uh, I, we will not be covering it on the podcast uh, other, than, <laughs> other than chatting about it uh, as we are here. Um, but I mean, it is... It, good choice. There's a lot about it that is still, you know, quite remarkable from a, a filmmaking standpoint. It's just... Ugh. Anyway, yeah, yeah, that was. That he's was a my brilliant. He's a brilliant filmmaker for sure, and I, yeah. I think he's insanely talented. And you know, I still have a huge amount of respect for him. And like you said, I mean, the craftsmanship and the production of Bo is Afraid is beautiful and you know well constructed, but the narrative, you know, yeah, yeah, and the length. And, what I kind of, what I like about his career because he's kind of and maybe Bo is afraid was like his way of escaping this sort of niche that I don't want to say he's created for himself but it's certainly it's it's in a lot of people's uh consciousness that he's known for taking the premises of really bad horror movies and making them art house and um Specifically, Hereditary is the plot of Paranormal Activity, but Art House. And Midsommar is Wicker Man, but Art House. So Bo is Afraid is just kind of like its own thing. It's not really any sort of adaptation or amalgamation of, of anything that already exists. It was just sort of like an inspirational story Thing that he wanted to he wanted to go for so you know I, I i liked the you know what he was doing at least with uh, his first two movies sounds fair yeah <laughs> <laughs> i haven't seen bo was afraid so i can i can offer nothing except i've heard uh middling to uh negative uh things from people who have seen it so i was like oh okay i won't rush I'll get to it you know eventually but it yeah. sounds a lot like your reaction to <clears throat> Both of you, your reaction to Bo's Afraid sounds a lot like me reacting to Nope. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it is about that third film with uh, these directors, the, these current run of like hot directors that we have. Um, yeah. But that's kind of the litmus test for like, okay, are you are, are you really in or are you? Mm. And uh, it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> but I'll, I'll watch the next. I'll watch the fourth film from both of them. I'm sure, but. Um, I, yeah, like I said, I still, I, I'm not rushing out to see, but I was afraid just based yeah. off of, like the, the general reaction to it. And interestingly, both of you are not fans of Nope, and I've I've still only seen it the one time. I need to uh, watch it again. Actually, uh, one of my so Patreon I. supporters, Queen Cream, sent me a, the Steel Book, so I still have it. So I need it's it's in my rotation. I need to watch it again. Because I want to watch it again. Because I didn't, I you know, I, I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. Like, I wasn't bowled over, like, uh, Get Out. Mm. Like, Get Out is, like, on a echelon of its own. Um, yeah. But, uh, Andre, I know that you, and not that we're going to go into, like, Jordan Peele territory here, but I know you you, <laughs> you weren't, like, a huge fan of Us, from what I recall, or or Nope, so. He... Yeah, I was, yeah, I, I love Get Out, yeah. and I love Jordan Peele's comedy, Um but I was disappointed with us, and then I saw the promotion for Nope, and I got excited, hoping that you know he would redeem himself with me. Um, and I just really didn't enjoy myself with that one either. So for me, it's I'm no longer like a fan of Jordan Peele. I'm just a fan of Get Out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, like then. 
you know, some people can look at it as like, you know, the current run of directors, one, two, uh, you know, you missed a beat. Uh, but, you know, everyone has <laughs> a, a different perspective of, of things. And I think that like everything that I understood, because I didn't really research like Ari Aster or just things that he said about Bo is Afraid, but it just seems like it was, um, he, it was a movie that he made for himself. And like, mm. that's fine. Like, you know, like the studio is like, here, mm. here's all your, you've done such great work for us. I believe Hereditary was the highest grossing A24 film until Everything Everywhere All at Once. So that's a record that it held for four years, uh, at least. So they're, you know, they're happy with him. They're going to continue working with him. I don't think oh, yeah. that Bo is Afraid is going to change any of that um, in, in any way. It was just, it was just sort of a like an honorary like here you go kid go nuts <laughs> yeah <laughs> i can respect that but at the same time after seeing the film and i'm just like you could have cut it down a bit i don't know <laughs> like, well like, i mean as an editor you're, all of it you're like, gonna be um god yeah i think probably up. the most critical yeah, yeah. um because I'm like that with movies that are already short enough, you know what I mean? So, yeah. And I and I agree because, um, I mean, already, like, I think that 90 minutes is a perfect uh, length for most movies. Obviously, there's some that can go yeah. up to two hours, but anything over two hours is just pushing it, uh, in my opinion. And it, it seems like every, every, like, big blockbuster these days has to be two and a half hours minimum. Um, it helps actually, like hearing you discuss Bo is Afraid, like the way you are right now, as far as just like kind of like loading me, you know, like equipping me. I feel like you're packing me with the baggage I need to kind of like go on that trip now. <laughs> and I was lucky enough with Hereditary to have a bag packed for me by um, this uh, critic uh, movie buff named Clark Wolf. She used to work on Collider. I don't know if she does anymore. I don't even know if Collider's a thing anymore because I don't watch... We discuss movies, so I, you know, I don't want to listen, spend all my time listening to other people discuss movies. I'd much rather discuss them with people, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, this was back when I used to like watch... A, uh, I think it was still AMC Collider at the time. I don't even remember. But I remember Clark Wolf had gotten in on a press screening, or I think she even might have seen it like at a, a film festival prior to its theatrical release, uh, Hereditary. And one thing that she said <laughs> that I t told my sister, who I went to go see the, the movie with the first time, uh, she said, I wish they hadn't put that item in the trailer that everybody's seeing for hereditary about the exorcist it said something like it's scarier than the exorcist or something like that and she said because i've spoken to too many people who are like god i wish they hadn't said that because i went in expecting the exorcist and it so isn't um it's good but i i didn't know how to receive they, they sent me in with like a mindset like oh, so i'm gonna go see like the next the exorcist she says and it's not she says, she says it's 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 exquisitely put together it's exquisitely acted it's not fun <laughs> and i was just kind of like okay so it's gonna be rough you know it's gonna be a rough ride but worth it is basically like the 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 messaging that i was given and i felt like that was kind of the best way to be equipped to go into the movie because uh i wasn't i was not disappointed in the least uh the first time i saw it um how about you guys I believe that quote in the trailer, it's, yeah. I think it says something like um, this generation's exorcist or something like mm. that. I know what you're talking about, right. but I think you're right. Like it, it does give like that expectation for the general audience, mm. but having seen, you know, it being out for five years now and having seen it a few more times and just it resonating longer, I can see where that quote is coming from. Like, sure. like I, I can for me it is the contemporary exorcist for my personal list of you know top tier horror but you're right they didn't necessarily need to put that in the trailer because then it's like making people think oh, i'm gonna go see a movie like the exorcist but the exorcist is also not fun so maybe i don't know um <laughs> <laughs> depends on but, who you yeah. watch it with if, if you that's watch the, it with the problem with trailer it's the problem with trailers and we've talked about that or you guys have talked about that you know sure like it, just expectations yeah. but yeah absolutely
if if you've listened to the Exorcist uh, podcast that we did, like I'm not a huge fan of that movie. So when, <laughs> whenever, like I feel that the the Exorcist, like it's a great movie, but it's in my opinion, it's a movie that's reputation is greater than its actual value as a movie. The quality of the movie, if if, if that makes sense, I feel like it, it's just like the, the, its reputation precedes it in a way. This is obviously just my opinion, but. Um, you know, when I hear stuff like that, it's just like, oh, this is like the next exorcist thing. Like, I don't give that any credence because I just like, all right, whatever, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Like, I, you know, someone said, oh, it's the next Halloween or Scream or, you know, something like that. I, may be, I, I might be like, oh, bullshit. And I need to watch this to like <laughs> prove that wrong. Um, but I actually, I don't remember seeing the trailer for Hereditary and I still don't think I've seen oh. it. I just went to the movie because um, I recall um, I went like maybe a few weeks after it came out, like at least like the next week because it had gotten a lot of word of mouth and it was, the word of mouth was very mixed like it was like it was very polarizing there was no like in between it was either like this is like the best horror movie to come out in you know forever even though i disagree because get out had just come out the year before or it's like oh it's such a piece of shit it's overhyped yada 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 um and i even remember like and i went with a friend um and the audience was packed like i i it, it had been a while since i'd seen a movie um th- like the, the having a theater that full and there were a lot of mixed reactions in the crowd uh mostly i think like there were people who were scared and there were people who found the movie to be downright comedic because there was people laughing at sure things that you know like were supposed to be scary and stuff so it was it's you know we've talked about like how um you know a, a movie theater experience can kind of uh, influence our opinion and I don't, I mean, it didn't necessarily influence mine, but it it would have been a lot nicer to have seen the movie without all those people there because it was like, it, it was so polarizing and so all over the place that it was hard to like really gauge one uh, specific attitude from, from the people watching it. And I think that, I haven't seen this movie a lot. Like I, I watched it last night uh, to prepare for this and I can't remember if I had seen it once between uh, my initial viewing or not. Um, so I, I, I can't really uh, tell you um, any like specifics of just like, you know, my, my experience seeing it other than that first movie uh, theater going experience. But uh, I think that this is, you know, a great movie. I, um, I don't want to say it's perfect because I do have, you know, like minor quibbles with it. But uh, just in terms of like, if I was to like say like what's the, what is the best horror movie that came out in two thousand and eighteen, uh, by a long shot it would be Hereditary. What about you, Andre? Um, yeah. So when I first got out of the theater, I didn't know how I felt about it, and I think my initial reaction was like, "Well, that was weird," <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> it was a genuine reaction. And I remember going on Facebook back. That's back when I used to use Facebook. Um, and just writing a, a post like, well, that was disturbing or something. That was my, it was very like vague, like a one line review. And people were like, well, what did you think? Like they wanted more from me and Mm -hmm. I just didn't know how to process it. I didn't know if I liked it or not. And I think once it came out on Blu-ray and I revisited it and just, it's, I got to sit with it more and just appreciate for what it is. It's, it grew on me so much. And it's one of my favorite movies. Um, Mm -hmm. Also, it's funny that you say that you, your audience was a mixed crowd of people, like some people were laughing. I have um, an aunt uh, who I'm close with who saw it, and she told me she started laughing when the scene happens, the scene, when we get to it. And she said she started, she burst out into laughter. <laughs> and I was like, are you a sociopath? Like, what is wrong with you? Like, I didn't understand her reaction. They, like, she didn't get the movie. Her husband didn't like it. Like, they just, they didn't like it. And I'm over here, like, saying it's the best contemporary horror film. Um, so, yeah, it's very polarizing. And I, I'm glad that I received it the way that I did, because I love it. But, yeah, there are people who just didn't get it, and they 
yeah, it didn't hit them the way it hit me. So it's interesting. Wow. I'm so lucky I saw it with the audience I saw it with. I don't know if I'm imagining it or not, but I feel like we were all on the same page. I don't remember a lot of distractions, but also the movie just gripped me. I remember, especially in my initial screening, like all of the, one of our buzzwords on this pod, uh, all of the trauma <laughs> that we were, you know, that you absorb the first time you're you're watching the movie when you don't know where it's going and what's kind of going to come next. You spend a lot of time with people who are uh, kind of living in survival mode at best and um, and coping, just, try, you know, just striving for normalcy would be a blessing, you know, like uh, whatever normalcy is. But um, uh, but just as a baseline, um I, I just remember absorbing like all of the tension that Ari Aster seemed to be setting up. I didn't even realize how much of the backdrop for me is through the sound design for this movie. Um, and not just the score, but there are pulses and low rumbles and low moans that sustain in scene that, that even connect scenes. Like there can be three scenes that are connected with this uh, continuous line of a pulsing, vibrating sound that almost kind of feels like blood pumping in your ears. You know, like if, you, if you're swimming for too long and you have like water in your ears and you can kind of feel your brain beating. <laughs> and it's not unbearable. It's not even, I, this is the first time I've ever been conscious of it, but I, I'm certain it's not the first time that I felt it. You know, like that's what kind of, what, what probably helped put me on edge so much that first time um i even remember the most shocking moment for me uh which i'll share in a moment because i do want to know like do you do either of you find any moments did you find any moments shocking in your initial screening uh and do you still have any moments that are that are that shock you at this point because i, I want to share mine after <laughs> well i mean do we dive in right away with what because <laughs> sure it's a specific yeah. it's a specific moment so obviously when the decapitation happens yeah um that i was not anticipating nor you know and this is when i knew the movie was special even though i didn't know how to process it afterwards i knew that it like did its job was because i gasped out loud and like i said i was by myself so i wasn't mm -hmm. like doing it with a crowd like i was just that was just my reaction my genuine reaction and when a movie can get me to feel like that, because <laughs> I'm so desensitized, I've seen everything and I'm kind of jaded. <laughs> so when I have a reaction like that, I, it, it's, it's, I'm just very grateful, you know, and it sticks with me. So I'm just like, wow, like kudos to the filmmakers, you know, for getting a rise out of me. And so the decapitation definitely caught me off guard because, you know, they set up uh, Charlie in such a light where you think either she's going to be the creepy um, character throughout the entire film right? or, or a victim or whatever, but you don't expect her to die so soon and so sudden and the way it happens, you know? So that's know. obviously the first time I assume that shocks a lot of people. Um, how about you, Zach? Yeah, I agree. Cause I mean, again, I hadn't seen any promotional material. I didn't know what the movie was about. I just kind of heard, you know, oh, it's it's great, it's terrible, um, and really like the first act of the movie is so Charlie focused that you know I agree it's like oh it's a, it's like a creepy kid movie how is this going to unravel so I was just kind of like falling back on what I'm used to with like creepy kid uh, tropes that the scene when it happened I was confused at first because i'm just like it happened so fast that i wasn't even sure what had happened because like it's it's very quick editing um and then you kind of process it it's almost like ari aster is like really good at putting you in the character's actual like position and state of mind that the way that you're comprehending it is still kind of the way that the characters do and I think like it, you know it took the whole trip home for um Peter um to just like go upstairs lay down and then like you hear uh Annie in the background like hey I'm going to the store be back in 20 minutes and then like 
all yeah. like chaos breaks loose and then and then you see the the shot of the head with like the the ants crawling all over it and it's just like okay um you know like you you know what happened like subconsciously but just because it doesn't really linger on the imagery of what happened it just more so lingers on the emotional responses or lack thereof that you're more so invested in that and it's just kind of like what what's going on like give me more um so it's really like until there that sort of segue from that and then like the funeral with like the you know the shot going underneath the ground to then when you're you're back with them and they're kind of like trying to find some uh state of normalcy after everything again that you're kind of like you've that's the point where you've processed it and like okay now i get everything that's happened of course now in like rewatches you're just like all right here it comes um but <laughs> but but yeah it was it, 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 i Maybe definitely not in that I, tone but yeah yeah I, I definitely um was not uh expecting that and i think that that was the moment as well that i just like knew like similar to your sentiments that like okay what i'm watching here is you know it uh has the 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 capacity uh to to be great um yeah i agree with both of you i i I remember i was definitely i'm not going to pretend i wasn't aghast when even I, i didn't know that it was a decapitation that occurred because of the way it's shot and everything i just kind of thought her head was knocked against the beam obviously there's no sound obviously we have that sustained shot on alex wolf just trying to function trying to process what just happened also not i i completely forgot about um a shot that i love of his pov just like checking the rear view mirror and then immediately avoiding it because he knows what's back there and but the first time i saw it i didn't so i just thought okay okay she's obviously unconscious possibly dead probably um because he seems pretty stunned i thought she was intact I didn't know until we saw the head on the side of the road with the ants crawling on it. And then I was, I, but I think I was maybe too, <laughs> maybe less shocked and more disgusted. I mean, just, you know, and not just, I mean, it's just, it's a gross thing to have to see, to imagine the head of this little girl is now severed and on the side of the road and covered in ants. Gross. Um, <laughs> among other things, you know, like I'm feeling everything with the family. I felt bad for her. I knew her life wasn't easy and that's no way to go. But I think the singular moment that shocked me the most, the one that made me gasp audibly was uh, uh, later on after all of this, when um, Annie is in uh, 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 Peter's room and he's waking up and he's he's he asks her why are you afraid of me and she's just standing and they just kind of have a little bit of an exchange and then finally there's a long pause and she just says i never wanted to be your mother and when she does it she like clasps her hand to her face i did the exact same thing and went (laughs) like huge gay gasp and i probably bother i probably disrupted everybody around me (laughs) who thought if anybody wasn't paying attention all of a sudden they were because oh my god what what just happened that that gay guy just gasped Um, um that was the most shocking one to me because that that's like that's not even horror that's like family D- domestic drama terror melodrama kind of you know like stuff but brutal and and it, it played into um i guess like this 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 reality horror <laughs> that um that i i agree with you andre in terms of just like i feel like my palate is pretty varied i feel like i've tasted a lot of different f- horror flavors and it's I, I don't know if it's hard to shock me but it's probably hard to surprise me and that surprised me because you don't see a lot of that in horror. A, an, a, an effective communication of an almost Freudian slip from this mother <laughs> to her son. And then the the fallout afterwards, him absorbing it and becoming emotional and her just trying to explain it away in a way that'll kind of make it make sense and also make it okay, which it of course can never be. I don't know, that... that was the slap across the face for me and it's still every time it happens that's actually the moment for me where i'm like oh god here it comes 
And I even, I felt myself cringing uh, uh, once the scene started. I was like, oh God, she's going to say it. Um, I mean, good thing yeah. it was just a, a dream. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, I, for, I forgot that, that it was a dream. You walk into it. I forgot, yeah, yeah, yeah. because it was, because they had already kind of had the, the scene where she, when she was telling Joan about how she used to sleepwalk and then like the, the paint thinner story. So I was just watching it. I was just kind of going back and forth and they were like progressively getting wetter. <laughs> I yeah. was just like, wow, they're really sweating. And then it wasn't until like, the, the flame started. I'm like, oh, she's dreaming. And it's like the paint thinner. Right. Yeah. But at that moment, you, but there's no paint thinner introduced prior to her saying that line. In yeah. Fact, there's a few lines that follow where you still kind of think you're watching something real. And I mean, Tony, I watched an interview with Tony Collette discussing uh, doing this movie. She said it's, one of the healthiest uh, experiences she's ever had <laughs> playing this character <laughs> because she learned, she said it was, she likened it to cooking, which I adore because the best thing that any chef will tell you is clean as you go. So she had to kind of check in because she was worried that it was going to be overwhelming and that she might, you know, have an avalanche hit her one day or something like that. So she basically just kind of like, clean as cleaned as she went every time she'd do a scene she'd do something some form of self-care or something to kind of soothe herself or connect with somebody so she wouldn't be only be kind of like left at the end of the day with this sense of loss or this sense of grief or even this sense of rage um and uh i, I could listen to tony collette speak forever i'm such a fan of her american accent like i this character every time she talks i'm just I, I don't know. I feel like she's my best friend, which is odd. <laughs> There's something about her that I absolutely adore being in her presence, no matter how how difficult she's being or how much she's struggling with whatever it is that's going on. I just want to be there and watch her go through it. It's so it's a strange thing, but I, I attribute it to her talent and and just her likability. I have a confession. I did uh, I did not know that she was Australian. I, I, for some reason, I, I, I mean, her American accent is so convincing and most of her performances yes. are in like using her American accent. And I think that like from way back in the day, I remember seeing her in, in an interview and I just like, for some reason thought maybe, okay, maybe she had a British accent or whatever, but I was just watching the, the, uh, feature on the, the Blu-ray. And when she started talking, I was just like, oh, wow, like. No, I, I had no idea. Um, yeah. So kudos to her, and she, yeah, she's phenomenal in this. And I mean, I, this has been a, a huge point of contention as well. It's just like how the the Academy uh, no. completely bypassed her performance here, and uh, yeah, you know what? Fuck no them. Good. They're no fuck, good. Yeah, yeah. They're, fuck fuck them. them. I don't like. Fuck them. Bullshit. Yeah. Bullshit. Trash. Trash. Fucker. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They've got, and now there's a, a triage of, is, it, is that the word, or a triad of actresses who they have uh, snubbed in recent years for their roles in horror films. There's Mia Goth in Pearl, yeah. or in, um, oh, I forgot the name. <laughs> What's the other one called? I'm sorry, it's, it's been a long day. Huh? Uh, Anya Taylor-Joy? No, 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 no. Um, the other, Mia Goth, the one, Pearl was X. the prequel to... X. That's why I couldn't yeah, remember. The it's one letter, letter um, title. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> a, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, just go through them all. <laughs> I'm tired. It was a really rough day and an even rougher week. Anyway. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. But, uh, no, so me and God, either of those movies. <laughs> <laughs> no, not maybe for you. Oh. <laughs> I don't do a Monday through Friday, Andre. <laughs> but, um... Anyway, Mia Goth, and then um, for me, Lupita Nyong'o in Us, which I think I made no mystery about that in the Us pod. And um, Florence Pugh in Midsommar. I didn't think Oscar when I saw her in that. She was definitely good. I was oh. like, fuck, I will watch this girl do anything. But I didn't, okay. I'll, but I won't argue. I'm not mad at it. Sure, why not? <laughs> if she won an Oscar for it, I wouldn't have been like, what? Unless I would have been like, so you're giving it to Florence Pugh, but not Tony Collette or Lupita yeah. or Mia. Well, fuck, then I'd be angry, you know, because they're still dissing my girls. But anyway, but um, I think one of the things that I also re respond with her, it's not just an accent, uh with Tony Collette uh, playing Annie, it's a it's an entire point of view, and maybe that's why I find it so fascinating to watch. Is because there's 
a fully dimensionalized human being. And I feel like everyone in the family brings that for me. Even the ones who... Uh, I, I remember uh, discussions that I'd have after the fact. Uh, if I, I, Sometimes people criticize things just because they need something to criticize. And I remember people criticizing Gabriel Byrne's role for not doing more. And I thought, but that's his role in the family. He's the caretaker. He's the bystander. He's the one who goes without so everybody else can you know, be okay in quotes or just, just he's the one looking out for everybody. He's the one who's putting everybody else's feelings and whatever first until finally he reaches his breaking point right before he dies, um, which he doesn't see coming. None of, nobody saw coming, but um, yeah, I just that might've been like, another but, moment. Uh, uh, <laughs> now that you mention it, yeah. that, 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 oh, that, when that, he... that was a surprise. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There by that point, I think I was beyond surprised at that point. I was just kind of like, "What else is going to happen?" <laughs> oh God, something terrible, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, because we're we're well into the third act at that yeah. point. But um, yeah, he actually he um delivered a very like understated, uh, but like like non-verbal performance because he doesn't say a lot. He just kind of you know, yeah. like does everything physically in the movie. And I, from his career or just like the movies I remember, like he usually plays these like larger than life rules um, that it, it was very, it was a change of pace for him. And I think that even when I saw this in the, in the theaters, I just kind of had to take a minute. I'm like, Oh, is that uh, Gabriel Byrne? Uh, Cause I didn't, I didn't recognize him right away. Oh, I, see, I knew, it, for me, it was a reunion between he and Alex Wolf because Gabriel Byrne was on an HBO series in treatment that lasted three seasons with him in the lead. He plays a therapist, so he's in every single episode. Yeah. Every episode is a, is a real-time therapy session. And um, Alex Wolf, when he was a little boy, I didn't even know his name was Alex Wolf at the time because I just thought, it's Max. He's just, you know, it's Paul's, Paul was... Uh, Gabriel Byrne's character. It's Paul's son, Max, little Max, poor Max. He doesn't have any friends. And then <laughs> I see this movie and I'm just like, oh my God, Max grew up. And he's, it's not, I have to stop thinking that I'm watching the first uh, exposure to the family we have is, I almost want to call him Max, Peter asleep in his bed. And Steve walks in to wake him up. And I'm just like, oh, I feel like I'm watching like a really fucked up episode of Entreatment. But, but like years later, like a requel. What's going? Okay, I need to shake that off. Um, but uh, yeah, so I knew that they were going to be good together. I, again, did very little with each other. But um, I heard in an interview Alex Wolf say that uh, Ari Aster would send him out on uh, tasks uh, with um, oh, oh uh, Millie Shapiro is that her name? Yes, who plays um, Sweet Charlie? Well, Sweet Creepy Charlie. We'll get to that in a moment. But um, he would send them out and basically ask Charlie to just tr you know try on whatever uh, 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 mindset she would go into as Charlie, and he would tell Alex, you have to go buy her a jacket. You have to get her to try it on. You have to know that it fits. And then you have to try and pay for it and leave the store. And she would be putting on the brakes and I don't want to try on the jacket. It would be, now you're embarrassing me in front of like this shopkeeper, this actual person who thinks that we're really brother and sister and stuff like that. And it set up this dynamic between them that I think you can see clearly on screen where there's concern there's love there's like a sibling connection between the two of them but there's also because it's a sibling connection there's there can also be resentment there can also be i know how she's gonna be i know that you know taking her to a party is not a good idea she's not like the other kids so i'm gonna passively try to put the brakes on as much as i can and not encourage this but once my mom makes up her mind about something, like if 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 Steve is the caretaker, I feel like Annie is kind of like the, in the driver's seat of the family. Like wherever she wants the family to go in whatever direction, they will or they have to. They're subject to kind of her will. That was my observation. I don't know if anybody else noticed anything like that. She was definitely in charge. 
Um, and it's it's funny that you say because on the show uh, that they were on, like he's a psychiatrist or therapist, because mm-hmm. he. I didn't realize that that was like because we don't really get a lot of background information on the characters other than like Annie and and like her side of the family and all that. Sure, and sure. in the, um, I mean, they might have mentioned it in the movie. I, I must have missed it. But uh, in the featurette, uh, they're describing how, um, what's the what's the husband's name? Steve. Steve. How Steve was her former therapist. And then after she was no longer his patient, they started a romantic relationship. What? <laughs> My head's exploding. <laughs> so, like, like, Andre, did you? Did now you know I have about to watch that? it again. Thanks, Zach. Oh my god, I did yeah, not I, know that. I did know about that, but I actually don't remember if I got, gathered that from the movie or from the additional features. Oh, um, I didn't really don't remember. Because I don't remember her mentioning anything about it. I feel like I would have. Glo- I think maybe he might have said something, that. but just because he is so like, wah, 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 you know, like whenever he talks, it's just like <laughs> it's not important that you're just like, okay, whatever. Like he might have said something, like maybe even in one of her moments of of grief or just being like, you know, how, remember how we, you know, used to, you know, process this or whatever. So it wasn't really like a, a plot point per se um but it just it, it kind of speaks to the volumes of just like ari aster's script and just like all the details that he put into it that you know might not have even come up at any point but were just so kind of like intertwined in in the whole aspect of it that uh you know even even in the characters like tony collette is obviously playing this this woman and you know even if it's not translated on the screen directly she knows that this was their relationship and she's playing it uh to to that point oh god i'm just in recovery (laughs) (laughs) i feel like my brain is a jigsaw puzzle and you just kind of but but like one of those three-dimensional jigsaw puzzles and you just kicked it (laughs) or is it like the jigsaw like the the reverse bear trap (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or a sandcastle maybe that's sure. more appropriate like it's a sandcastle that was like already on shaky ground and it's just been kicked but I, I appreciate the kick though I wow that's fucking crazy I wonder what else don't we know about that they knew like going in that like you know would help them work and everything like that um, well I think that like and this is just another thing of just like Ari Aster because sort of like the horror that he has on display is is more so just it's like the human uh drama of it it's it's that element sure. it's in this case like it's just really like an exploration of grief and or just say like family trauma and really like the 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 more like plotty sort of stuff is just window dressing where it's it's interesting and that's like the paranormal activity aspect of it um, and certainly, like all of the like the Tony Collette and all that drama is what paranormal activity is missing, aside from like you know a well crafted uh, <laughs> movie and cinematography. Oh, wow. But it's no, it's the same story because I you said something that mm-hmm. that uh, piques my interest because you referred to Charlie as sweet little Charlie. You said sweet but creepy little Charlie. S- sweet, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. you said sweet. And this yeah. is where, you know, this is where I'm interested in, like, the plot. Because I want to, like, dive into everything that was happening. Because from my understanding of, of things is that Charlie was Payman. Payman yes. was inhabiting Charlie's body. Is that yes. true? To yes. Think? Okay. All right. So sweet, when you say sweet Charlie, you mean sweet Payman. Just, just... Well, sweet Charlie didn't know that they were sweet payment, <laughs> that they were king payment. It's like Damien. It's, it's that uh, whole, it, it, exactly. It goes right back to Damien. It's just kind of like the, the first, if the devil were to be born, would they, would the devil know that, Hey, I'm the devil. Or would they just kind of, you know, grow up like a regular kid and then have somebody come and tell them in a kind of like antichrist 
<laughs> funny play on words, but <laughs> like antichrist rhetoric, because apparently there 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 are stories that people love to either build upon or or make up entirely ab about Christ finding out the Christ child yeah. finding out you know you're the Messiah and you're going to be killed by the people who follow you and love you and who you trust. Mm -hmm. And you're going to become this emblem and everything like that. And the first thing that you usually get, get a reaction is, why? No, no, why? And in Damien the Omen 2, you get the same exact thing from the Antichrist child finding out, I'm supposed to be the dumb, but I don't want I just want to be a little boy, damn it. And I, I don't know. He was doing some that. pretty like evil things in the first movie. Knowingly. Well, but how knowing are you when you're like a toddler and a preschooler? He literally like, I feel turned like... his head to the camera and broke the fourth wall to like, more or less like smile. I mean, I, I don't think there was a wink there, but there there may as well have been one. But I feel like that's okay. We'll we'll have this argument when we discuss the omen because that 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 that's a whole other can of worms. But for payment, I feel like the story that they're telling that I feel still largely associate with Damien is that like there are these impulses that you're having that you don't understand and there and there are and you there are these reasons you don't fit that you don't can't quite grasp and you don't know where you belong you just feel lost you move at a different frequency than everybody else and all you want to do is just kind of like uh, 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 seclude yourself is just kind of like isolate as much as possible because even the people in your own family don't seem to uh, understand you, except for grandma, who seems to love you unconditionally. And I mean, and that's the way it's being presented to you. You don't know what it really means. You don't know what she's going to get out of this, you know? Yeah. Um, so does that mean I, that the that... real Charlie was yeah. like the soul of the real Charlie was just like expunged? Or something, whether it was like, you know, after birth so. or, or, you know, in the womb. Or you think that like, oh. so you think this is like a Rosemary's Baby situation where, where Satan or whoever the father of King Payman is impregnated Annie. I guess it would, de no, I guess it would depend on when Ellen, Annie's mom, started her whole process <clears throat> and what that entailed, like. It was she, when she was a baby and she was feeding her. Because if you look at the pictures where she's feeding her with the bottle, right? There's that there's that herbal stuff in it that uh, Annie later has in right. her tea. Right. The little. So it was when she like, was a baby. They started the process of putting. So maybe there was a soul of an actual Charlie that was expunged at a really early yeah. stage, that Payman took over the same way he did. Uh, Peter's body that we see. I love, uh, there were people who didn't catch it. I remember I saw it the first time when, after he leaps out of that window and lands on the lawn and you can see this black shadow passing out away from him as this white orb drops down. And I remember thinking, oh, bye Peter. Oh, I know who that is. <laughs> and I wasn't looking forward to seeing Charlie at that particular juncture. Uh, but I mean, I, again, it, I, it's funny. I'm surprised myself that I call Charlie sweet because I remember another thing in a lot of conversations I observe and that I'd have with people about this movie in its release. A lot of, because a lot of horror fans are introverts and have kind of awkward social upbringings and everything. And a lot of people saw Charlie at that party and felt uh, an incredible uh, uh, affinity for and a, and a sympathy or sympathy empathy for her position so much so that that kind of I guess made them forget that she also cut the head off of a pigeon <laughs> which I never forgot I was always like no 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 I mean I, I feel for you girl I mean if you don't want to be at a party that's the worst place in the world to be but you you cut the head off of an already dead pigeon and then you made a little you know like little play thing out of it and I, 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 I like your creativity you're creative like your mother good for you hereditary but there are more constructive less disease <laughs> less infectious ways of creating art, you know, or amusing yourself, you know, with the scissors and the, and the 
I don't know. Yeah. What, how did she attach it? Was it glue or was it <laughs> arts and crafts? Arts I, and crafts. Yeah. Just go on YouTube. Go on YouTube, <laughs> darling. <laughs> I think the thing that but, um, yeah, because after all that, you talk about like Peter uh, leaping out the window, uh, like Renee Zellweger in uh, Texas Chainsaw Four. <laughs> <laughs> to but to to right. to uh, worse results, but um, right after that, <laughs> I think like I, the the upsetting part of the movie for me, and and one that actually the entire audience responded to, was seeing the dead dog, just kind of mm, laying oh. there in the distance, and it was in a way it was almost like I think some people might have laughed, and I get that because the whole movie, I think there was a, I think the last time we see the dog was um i know it was like st- it was in peter's doorway and it was barking and then the door shut right but at a certain point i kept like asking like where's the dog like you could hear yeah. him barking in some scenes i think that was like but it would have been a while since we'd seen him and then we saw him there and then by the end of the movie all i was thinking about is like where's the dog in all this and then we see him, <laughs> the dog there and i'm like oh but that was kind of funny that i was thinking it and then it showed it <laughs> I mean, yeah, the dog is uh, dog may as well not be there as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, He's in a long line of of single white female buddies of just the unfortunate pet that, you know, happened to I mean, be there. my cat Des gets more screen time on this pod than that dog got in hereditary. <laughs> like, um, Cuz that's the thing. Like I th- I feel like maybe if they had the dog on screen too often maybe it would it would bespeak like a subliminal layer of functioning and warmth which Ari Aster did not want this family to be depicted as like maybe maybe barely functioning but warmth absolutely not um not that it's cold it's it's actually I, I get heat like like tension like 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 a, like I don't know like t- yeah yeah that's that's the only way I can really describe it it's just kind of like maybe like a, a, a pot over a low flame for a long period and a dog can't exist in a pot I don't, uh, these quotes. A are rabbit golden. could. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Andre, what about you? Do any characters or uh, uh, any members of the family in their predicaments particularly stand out for you when you think about this movie? Yeah, actually, thank you for asking. Um, going back to the scene when the decapitation happens, um, it really stuck with me because. I have two younger sisters who I'm really close with and um, Mm. we're about six and seven years apart. So not, so the dynamic is not exactly the same as them, but it felt very similar and familiar to me. Um, Especially when she starts to have her allergic reaction and he's like panicking and he's like carrying her out, like physically holding her, carrying her out of the party. That really hit me hard. Like, I don't know, just that, emotional connection that i have with my sisters it just i don't know it just really resonated with me deeply and so when it does go down the way it goes down his reaction like you know as a viewer you're just like what the fuck just happened but like if you put yourself and like you said before you know you're kind of in his shoes the way ari shoots it um he's just in shock and right that's I I can't say that's how I would react or that's how I'd feel, but I understand how Peter is feeling and like how he's shutting down. So that whole scene is just so powerful to me, just not only because of the shock value, but just the way it's constructed. And also like the way Ari does the foreshadowing throughout the movie, like, you know, in the very beginning with the mention of her EpiPen and does that have nuts in the candy she's eating, you know? And then the first shot at the party is someone cutting up a bunch of nuts for this cake. Like the way he sets these things up is just so genius to me. And like first time watching it, none of that registers at all for me. No. Yeah. It goes right over my head. Rewatching it. You're like, wow, he really laid it out. It's very choreographed and just, it's perfect. But yeah. All I can think is like, that was like the quickest cake that was ever baked in like the history of cinema. <laughs> maybe they were making a bunch of them. Like maybe that, that it's was like, one that was already. Yeah, it's like it's like the talk show, or just like you know, um, Rachel Ray or whatever. Like Marshall, we're, we're gonna yeah. we're we're preparing it, but oh wait, we already had one in the oven for uh, for a minute. So, yeah. Um, 
I think like the thing that I, because I mean, it always comes back to to Tony Collette, and just like re- responding to her and kind of like her actually her, her relationship with Peter uh, throughout Ooh. the movie because it's like he knows he fucked because i mean like i you know you get that like shock in that moment and you kind of like even if it's not how you would respond of just kind of like okay now we're gonna like drive away quietly go home and go to bed sort of thing but you can like you can tell like somewhere in there he knows like mom's gonna be pissed between the scenes where uh he, she gives him the car to go to the party uh, until they have that the dinner scene where they, you know, explode at each other. There's not really any communication between them. There's just, I don't even think they're, if they are in the same scene together, it's just kind of like him standing behind a door and just like listening to her, mm-hmm. you know, falling apart. She's she's doing the thing that uh, uh, Florence Pugh does in, in Midsommar after you know, she sees what she sees in, in the movie when, when all the, the other women are like, you know, uh, doing the whole thing with her, the crying. Keening. Yeah. When they keen. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but it's, you, you have the moment where he comes home on his bike and he sort of like hesitates going into the house. Like he knows it's just like, this is, a, this is fucked. And he doesn't see her in the car, but she's just sort of waiting for him to go in to, to turn on the ignition and drive off. Like, there's clearly resentment there that's unspoken of. And it's not until, like, they don't have any interaction between those two scenes. But when she goes to Joan's house and then Joan is like, how is your relationship with your son? And she's she kind of, like, just, like, blows it off. She's like, oh, you know, it's, you know, it's fine whatever and it's just like you haven't talked to him in in this entire time you have like haven't had a conversation about it and i feel like it's so palpable just that tension between them uh even though they're they're not interacting in any of that span of time because it's that's like quite a stretch of the movie um that when it finally does happen at the dinner table it's like and and the fact that you can even register Mm -hmm the tension just in the way they look at each other for like seconds and then look away like the way he's telling uh, the way that uh peter is telling steve like how much you know how good it, it's really really good dad and everything i mean that tension around the table like uh, i i i don't i i'd 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 love to hear from anyone who's ever been a member of a family and never had an awkward meal for whatever reason but an awkward meal like that where someone's mad at somebody else somebody did something and fucked up and but we're all gonna sit around a table with each other <laughs> and eat because it's what civilized people do when really what we really want to do is either scream our lungs out or just isolate just be away from each other and maybe if we didn't try to sit here and pretend like this is still a family unit that's working you know like if we just could say the truth like but, but I I but at the same time like how how can you possibly <laughs> without unleashing the way um i mean I, i'm sure therapists would know better ways but i mean <laughs> well clearly but not something, <laughs> but there's something cl- clearly not <laughs> now that Sorry. we know steve is a therapist yeah. an ex-therapist but uh, no but there's something about the, uh, the way i love the language that they use with each other when um when Peter is telling Annie, just release yourself. She's like, you mean release you? And he's like, fine, then release me. And I'm like, this is, all, everything that they're saying makes total sense based off of what what I've already observed, uh, uh, the, the dynamic between them up until now. Because until they yell at you, until they care enough about you to get in, to, to get in your face and tell you what you did was really, really funny. They don't have to scream it, you know, or anything like that. But just to admit, yes, you pissed me off. Yes, you fucked up. Yes, it's it's a terrible thing that happened and i yeah i am angry um that alone is an act, can be an act of love because you're sharing your truth with someone but because they're sitting there with their stomachs t- tied up in knots not talking about it it's like their love can't exist there so in an odd way th- 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 maybe this is why tony collette also found a lot of this really healthy that release that she kind of unleashes on him um 
is the purest truth she could have given him. And I love that it's not just about him. She's not just raging at him. She's saying, and it's just such a waste that it couldn't just have bring up, brought us closer together or that we couldn't, because uh, because no one in this family can admit what, they're, what they've really done and everything. And I'm like, okay, that is decades old resentment. That's your mother that you're talking about in addition to your son. But like you're, this dynamic you've had to exist around your entire life and you are just purging everything and watching um, Peter's face as he's just absorbing it. Like that's one thing that I love seeing um, Alex as an actor playing Peter. He absorbs a lot and, and just kind of like, I don't know, questions things without lines a lot of the time. There's a lot of scenes where all he's doing is looking and wondering. And I find that just as uh, 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 fascinating as I do watching like Toni Collette with her American accent and her POV. Um, <laughs> so, it, but I mean, what Ari Aster does, I think, is r really, really well with this movie is inhabit grief. Uh, we're just absorbing people, inhabit it at whatever stage we may find them at. Even though I had forgotten about a moment that I love where Annie's talking to, um, uh, 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 what's her name? The woman? Uh, Joan. Joan! I should have, I should have remembered that, Joan. But, um, Joan! It's and Joan, but, um, <laughs> Joan! So... <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> Can you imagine Betty Davis playing Annie and Joan Crawford <laughs> playing Joan? <laughs> Joan, what are you doing here at this crafting house? Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, <laughs> um, when she's talking to Joan and uh, Joan just wants to know like how she's doing, she doesn't know her yet. It's like the first meeting, and she's and you see uh, Annie say, uh, "My daughter was killed." And then you see Tony Collette with her acting kind of realize that's the first time I've said that out loud. Wow. It's now it's true. You know, I've actually shared this with someone who didn't know already. And that's my life now. You know, that's I, just the life I'm living in. And I kind of got the you, impression you, yeah, yeah. that uh, like even like in, in her first group therapy, that was the first time she was even talking about the stuff with her mother. Right. Yeah. To, to that extent. Like, I mean, because also that, oh God, that speech is amazing. And the way it's shot just in that long uh, uh, dolly in toward her um, in the group. Like, oh, what a gift. I was looking, I, I wanted to go back. I forgot because I watched it last night too. And by the time it was done, I was too tired uh, to remember anything. But um, I wanted to go back and look at the group and see if Joan was actually seated among the people. In she, that was. First she was. Scene. Is she? Okay, I was cool. more. I was I could... more curious if she was at the uh, the the wake or the you know like the uh, funeral for oh, for uh, the mother at the beginning. Ellen. I feel like she yeah. probably wouldn't have been just because it would have that would have been too risky for uh, for Annie to have recognized her. By the way, how, like, the moment that she um, showed up at her house and, like, saw the doormat and was like, oh, my mother used to make that. And just, like, immediately, like, she's in on it. Don't trust yeah. her. <laughs> <laughs> well, because even the way, like, Joan answers, she's just kind of like, oh, really? Well, that seems interesting. And yeah. they just kind of go in. And I'm like, yeah, way to, way to slough it off, Joan. Good, good cover. Yeah. Good cover. <laughs> um, but I want to say, uh, uh, to Andre's point, because he was talking about, like, things that you recognize that Ari Aster put into place uh, that you don't, that you might not pick up the first time. There were so many themes that were introduced early on, like um, just Annie's uh, comment at the wake when she's just standing there at the podium and she talks about all these strange new faces at the funeral that she's seeing. And I'm just kind of like, oh my God, we're already setting up like the fact that your mother had this entire life that you didn't know about and you're not even questioning it because you're too kind of like in your own fuckity up it is um with the fact that i always felt like annie was almost upset she wasn't feeling more grief about it like it was her feelings with her mother were already so complex and now that her mother has died 
she's left with only more questions. Like there is there is a, a tenable difference between whatever the family's experiencing after losing Ellen versus what the family experiences after losing Charlie. Like that is the real loss. Uh, there, I, I had forgotten all about uh, Steve going into Peter's room after the first funeral, after Ellen's funeral and asking him like, you all right? You feeling, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what it is he asks him, but he's just checking in to see if he's he just sad shrugs. or anything. And he just kind of shrugs like, mm. and, and Steve is like, you know, yeah, like, I, know. I, I yeah, get yeah. it. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> and it, um, those, those were all things that I, I don't know if you can notice them because you're kind of like a stranger at the funeral yourself the first time you see the movie. But the second time you, you know everything that's going on, being ahead of the game, even when they're discussing Heracles in um, Peter's class and they discuss, I wrote the, this quote, that they're pawns in this horrible, helpless machine beyond the family dynamics and everything like that, there's also this greater scope of, um, that, that's also kind of doubled down on with the, uh, the miniatures and everything that Annie's putting together. And it makes us all diminutive. It makes us all, you know, also kind of toy-like, like we're these play things for- and I, Even the way that the, about the movie it. opens and the scene that you talked about of just like how it goes yeah. into the house and yeah. you know that that right away should have told us like oh they're you know someone's playing god with their lives yeah right. like we're playing the sims with hereditary mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. but, um, <laughs> i did i heard once and i can't remember what it is maybe one of you know I think it was Ari Aster spoke about what those reflective prismy lights were supposed to represent every time they'd kind of dash across a room. There were all these wipes of light that happened. Do you remember what it was, Andre? Um, I've heard that it was payment. Fuck. Mm-hmm. But I, I think you can interpret it multiple ways. How do you interpret it, Zach? I mean, if it's payment, then that kind of contradicts with payment already being... Uh possessing charlie well because like every time that it shows up it sort of uh it, it moves characters to go somewhere or to get mm-hmm. to go into like there is one uh point that i noticed it in it was when after she had got to uh, joan's number so it was probably like weeks later and she's mm. painting and then you see the flash of light behind her and then the paint spills And it spills on the piece of paper, which then segues into her calling up Joan and and going over to her apartment. But uh, Mm. I don't know. That, like, freaks me out because, like, I'll always see, like, you know, a a reflection or, like, a flash of light somewhere. Like, there's uh, the the building across the street from me. There's always, like, this something that's reflecting light. And it, like, flashes into my uh, apartment multiple no. times a day and <laughs> i don't like i don't like normal uh, all i think is like flash photography or something but then like you know watching hereditary i'm just like oh it's king payment <laughs> 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 or maybe one of the other seven gods of uh, not gods kings of hell yeah. or something like that um i i did have three definite nope moments not nope the movie but just moments that make me like i just did just, nope um <laughs> not having it i wouldn't be there no uh and the first one was when uh ellen's go oh, i don't know her ghost or whatever her her apparition appears in the room pretty early in the movie and annie turns on the lights and then it's gone but even before that because she's standing there for a while and i'm like nope no 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 no, no. i wouldn't Love even that. touch the lights i just leave i just leave i just leave. see that's when we get into like that now it's a horror movie no i would turn on I the light because <laughs> no 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 that was you, very just enjoy your shadow <laughs> that was very um lights out the the, the short yeah the short film the inspiration the good one for the yeah i mean i i've only release. seen the, the, the theatrical one once but yeah the, the short oh film is... you should see the short one no i have I, no one. i Oh, you have? Yeah, that was what I initially saw. And the, yeah, the theatrical didn't uh, live up to it um, or just kind of like ruined all the things that were great about it. But that's, that's what I was getting from that scene, um, which is why I was just like, no, I'm turning the light back on. Um, Right. 
<laughs> but uh, was that definitely her mother, though? Because it, it was hard to tell. And there's so many instances, especially towards the end of the movie, where there's just these figures who are just there in the dark. And there's the one that he... That, um, Peter sees when he turns around and it's standing in the doorway and it's oh, yeah. clearly the guy from that he was at the funeral he had like the big smile yes. that we see at the beginning yeah um, creepy guy so everyone in this movie is creepy yeah. <laughs> but she says mom doesn't she yeah. the, that first, first... the first one's her mother for yeah. sure yeah because yeah. she even says mom she says she thought she second... saw her, her, her mother yeah sure yeah. and the second note was uh, a, a, another use of light um, that I had forgotten about they had the light from the heater in the treehouse uh that charlie loves to sleep in being reflected in um uh peter's eyes while he's laying awake in bed after you know all of the events and then he's he's just laying there and it's tense and sad enough and then you hear and i'm like no 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 um <laughs> Not cool, not cool. And then, of course, the 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 last nope uh, moment for me. Surprisingly, it's not Annie. A lot of people are really terrified of Annie's kind of descent uh, in the third act. For me, it's actually prior to that when again Peter's in bed and he sees uh, Charlie standing there, and her head rolls off toward him onto the floor and then it turns into a ball and I'm just like no okay well guess I'm moving I I don't live here anymore so good <laughs> terrifying yeah, can't, so good can't do it can't and it's and I must because I'm gonna watch the movie many more times in my life <laughs> um which surprised me to your point about uh Charlie not being cognizant that she is payment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I did want to bring up the fact that, you know, we when we first are introduced to her, she is sleeping in the treehouse and she doesn't have the heaters, like the space heaters that are there when Annie's sleeping later. And I and I remember reading something or watching something and it was suggesting that the reason why she kept going out there um, to do that is because Charlie um was actually trying to kill herself uh, in any way that she can. So in this case, it was like it was uh, death by pneumonia or just, you know, sleeping out in the cold um, multiple times that like she knew that like she wasn't she didn't want to be in this body or payment didn't want to be in this body. And it was just that was kind of. You know, it, obviously, like when you're a child and you're under the the control of your parents, they're not going to allow you to, you know, do these reckless things. So I think that's why, like that, when we see the light that you know eventually like steps in, and maybe the light was the yeah. was uh, uh, grandma, grandmother, Gra <laughs> grandmother, <laughs> Laurie Strode, um, Ellen. <laughs> it was Laurie Strode. That's who it was. <laughs> it was Re Halloween Resurrection. Laurie Strode. No, it was a grandmother. Uh, it, it was because like it's that could have been her light. The only, like the, it's hard mm. to say because like that's the light that goes into Peter at the end. So it's like you know it is payment, but it's if if it is like a spirit or just something that's kind of guiding them, like it could have been the uh, uh, the mother, grandmother. Sure. I mean, well, I mean, it's also I mean, okay. Do either of you have a theory about what was quote unquote really going on with um, Joan and her grandson with the glass? Do you, do we believe the story that she told to Annie is the truth? Just happens to be the truth, and it works to entice her to get her into this web with this cult or coven or whatever we want to call the naked old people or is this crafted is this all a scheme to try and get her and maybe one of their little mischievous deities or demons is the one pushing the glass do either of you have a strong opinion about that i think the, <laughs> i think the latter i think that they were manipulating the situation to get her to feel a type of way. Yeah, okay. def I agree. Because we, I mean, even like there's the two beats 
where you know in that scene where Annie looks under the table just to make sure that nothing is happening and then and then uh, again when they're doing the seance and uh, Steve looks under the table um, right, to, right. To, to check for the same thing and it's like you know that Joan probably never had like children or or grandchildren sort of thing I don't imagine that like any of these people did I mean maybe like whatever this cult is um, Ellen was like the designated uh, birth giver that she was chosen to be. Sure. She is the one who's going to give birth to the vessel that was going to be given to payment. But then like she had two kids and I don't know what the like, because that's a, where the backstory gets kind of complicated because she talks about how her brother was schizophrenic and he right. I don't remember if he like died or he, he had killed himself. Uh, or what the what the situation was, but it, you know what I gathered from that is like either he was driven mad by you know things that they had done to him, or maybe he was mm-hmm. you know he 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 uh, did have um, schizophrenia, and it was almost like oh well payment payment don't like that that's not a good um, <laughs> like vessel for payment, and obviously and and this is this is where you know you kind of you know, rolled your eyes at me when I brought up the paranormal activity thing. But like, this is where like the paranormal activity comes into it because the whole uh, mythology behind paranormal activity is like this coven and they're trying, they they need to have like this, this lineage where there's finally a male vessel for Toby or whoever to, uh, to possess. So it, you know, from what, from what we understand of just like the little bit that Annie explains, like her, her father died, you know, make it sound like the, the, the grandmother killed him or, or whatever. So it's just like, I would, I would argue that it was all like what you're talking about with the, uh, what Joan was doing with the, or if there was a grandchild or, or, you know, a son or a grandson. Yeah. That was all manipulation because everything that they've done is manipulating. And I, I think that they're none of these people have kids. It's just Ellen and they're that's why they're so important. If there was other kids, then they probably wouldn't care about Annie. Like there's nothing important specifically about this family that that other than whatever position that Ellen held within this cult or coven um as to why Payman would need to uh, inhabit someone from from their lineage because otherwise it could have been like any anyone else's child okay the only reason i ask is just because if that's the case then joan's a really good actress because when she tells that story she I, i'm right there with annie hearing mm-hmm. it and when uh, you know like when she hears how old the grandson was when you know, she's like oh my god i'm just like yeah right <laughs> i mean i again i'm like <laughs> well then maybe betty the should uh, should play joan and joan should play annie since since joan <laughs> is the star and betty is the actress i would never <laughs> say joan is the star and betty is <laughs> the, the actress but i will you know well we've had that conversation before or have we have we done baby jane on this pod we yet? haven't done baby jane Jane yet okay we'll have that conversation when we get to okay. that but um but um one, one thing about uh uh joan of this movie though uh that i really appreciated it's played by ann dowd who i had seen in a movie that i will never see again uh because of the effect it had on me uh compliance have either of you seen this movie i've heard of it Okay, I would never encourage anybody to see it, but if, if, if it piques your interest, it's just about, with, with no spoilers, but it's just about, it's, it's loosely based around situations that actually happened where somebody calls a, a random business. McDonald's. Uh, pretending to, yeah. Like well, give a little bit more information. Like if someone wants to look it up, they can, because it's a true okay, story. Okay, pretending yeah. to, but somebody basically can do this yeah. call up pretending to be management and use these manipulation uh tactics to basically uh control you because what people want to do first and foremost i mean sociologically it's kind of fascinating but i would have rather watched maybe a documentary about it than like a dramatized <clears throat> film where you have to actually watch people be whittled down to their basest you know compliant uh uh, uh elements at, to the point where they're doing things where I'm like, I can't believe I'm sitting here watching this. Um, and all the people who were making sense of it are, it, it was very grating. And when it was over, I didn't think I was 
glad that I saw it. <laughs> I satisfied my curiosity because I had heard about it, but um, Anne Dowd plays kind of like the uh, the matriarchal <laughs> um, compliant person. Like she's the one who's in charge, so she's the reason everything ki that goes down kind of goes down. Um, so she's kind of a terrible person in it. So when I got to see her in this, I was like, I want, I can't wait to see her play somebody likable. Cause I think she's also in, I haven't seen the handmaid's tale yet either, but apparently she plays a really horrible character on that too. So I'm wondering if she's ever, this is the most I've ever empathized with her in a movie was just her giving that speech about her, her son and her grandson. Um, and it was all so smoke know, and mirrors. I hope there's a, there's a part of me that hopes maybe it's true. Maybe her, her, her grief is real and she's just using it to <laughs> for evil <laughs> so to kind of go back to that um the scene where she approaches annie there in the parking lot during the daytime and yeah. she's she's telling her about the seance yeah if you look at her car her car because they were both shopping there her car yeah. trunk is open and she she's buying the chalkboard <gasps> so that you can see in the trunk, so that goes to show that <sighs> she's she's lying. <laughs> oh my god! Look at you. I don't it's believe just like I... some next level who killed who and <laughs> hereditary. <laughs> I don't believe in anything anymore. I have no faith in anybody. The world is a terrible place, and I hate everyone. That's why oh I was like god. letting you letting you talk about her, and I was like, uh, should I drop this bomb on him? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely blow the <laughs> shit <laughs> out of him whatever you can <laughs> release me Andre. <laughs> oh, but um no it was uh, i hadn't i couldn't remember like uh every everything that everyone in annie's family had suffered like her mother having did dissociative identity disorder and dementia and you already mentioned the schizophrenia her brother had her father had psychotic depression um that in and of itself is a lot that would prevent but me from marrying anyone did the did the mother really have that or you know is that more of just like her manipulating oh, i have them? no problem believing no i have no problem believing her mother full-on had all of that and was just as you know in the in the crux of what she was doing maybe maybe they helped her maybe they were things that boosted her to do what was necessary within, you know, well, the framework of in her the own the note that she left for her, in the scene that you're talking about where she sees her apparition, because she's she right. opens that book and she finds the note from her, and I forget I didn't pause it, so I don't uh, remember exactly what it said, but it's something about like soon you'll understand like the the gifts of all this or you know whatever, and of course Annie just like right. rules her eyes and just like whatever what a crazy bitch right, right, right and you know that's what makes me think that like maybe ellen didn't die naturally but it was more of just like the, it was her time it was like the of the process of what they're doing it's just like you're now going to be more useful dead than you would be mm. alive that you can do more work because like the way that they're kind of hyping up this whole thing is that you know you get eternal life or whatever just like what you know afterwards um you know even if, if once you pass through this world you're still gonna be there with king payman doing all this mm -hmm. mischievous stuff and you know being a a hell king and <laughs> whatnot uh, one of their loyal subjects so i i she's such a fascinating character for a character that yeah. like is technically not seen living on screen at any point like we see her dead yeah. but in the in the coffin but um there's there, I, 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 there's so much i want to know you know because there's there's these questions that that uh are just sort of we, we skim the surface of and that's why i don't believe that you know she did have any of those things i think that everything she did was very meticulously planned right down to the last mm. detail for the events of what we see uh take place in this movie okay. you're not yeah even Andre what do you I was think? I was gonna say I think I agree I think her death was planned because um her headless corpse was part of the ritual at the end right right and right. payman needs three heads for the ritual to commence properly um which is Ellen's head 
Charlie's head, and then um, Annie's head. So they needed her head. So she's the first to die, and then Charlie, and then Annie. So I do think that her death was planned. Mm. But do you think? What do you think that she actually could have had dissociative identity I mean, disorder? And I, I don't think anyone had any disorder, and I don't think the brother had schizophrenia, schizophrenia either, because she says he accused my mom of trying to put people inside him. That's literally what mm. she was doing. Right. So, that's true. But if you look at it from like a medical standpoint, you're like, oh, that person is schizo. Mm. Um, but in reality, he was just telling the truth. So, and he hung himself because she's. Uh, she said he hung himself on her mother's bedpost, and I think he killed himself to escape her. Essentially, right. that's that's my takeaway from it. And do we think maybe her father didn't suffer from so much psychotic depression as he just became conscious of exactly maybe who his wife was and what she was willing to sacrifice in order to achieve what she needed to and maybe that's just what made him because i don't even i've never even heard of psychotic depression i've heard of psych psychotics and i've heard of you know depression <laughs> i've experienced depression um some people might say i've experienced psychosis but um <laughs> combined together i don't know exactly I, my sister is a therapist i should ask her we didn't talk about it that much after the movie because that's not what the movie's about but I'd, I'd i'd be interested to hear her opinion about any of that uh, maybe uh, yeah maybe i don't know maybe the men were just reeling from what was going on the way like the family that we're watching now the grams are were are, you know are reeling from everything that they're experiencing and it seems to manifest in ways that we can label with science because of the symptoms the symptoms yeah. seemed that they can be attributed to this and that mm -hmm. but there's a whole other story that no one in the science world is being privy to uh, it's interesting then on. that uh Stephen is quite literally a, a therapist because he's sort of like the antithesis of the that you know he he's the one that's like bringing in like the the, the medical aspect and like the the logic of it while you know yeah. i i don't know if that was something that i necessarily needed to see explore more but that might have made his role seem a little bit more um important uh if there was this because it, it's not really till the end that he's just kind of like it was you like you you like desecrated the the graves and you put the bodies up there like he just like full-on uh, like goes off on her and like you know doesn't he, want he to turns listen. In, yeah. he turns into mary in her final moments in psycho 2 you did it you did it all <laughs> <laughs> and then spin spin out of yeah. the frame as you get shot <laughs> <laughs> but um <laughs> i mean there are so many things that i that i i feel like i could literally do a pod about this movie once a year like every year <laughs> watch it again and sit down and discuss okay what did you get from it this time and what did, you know what what what, what affected you because another thing i was struck by annie's uh presumed neutral view of the accident when she was creating that miniature of it and i'm watching it and i'm just thinking like oh she's she's going there she's making a miniature of the accident okay she's processing she's doing what she needs to do to kind of like make some sense out of it cool and then walks her husband <laughs> and immediately steve is just kind of like what the hell is that you know like what do you think your son is gonna think of i can't do gabriel burns accent but like what do you what do you think your son is going to think about this i, I don't know <laughs> i don't know how irish he was in this movie but um he's always a little irish but um he's just like what do you think your son's gonna think about this how do, how do you think it's going to affect um uh, peter and all that kind of thing and i'm just kind of like oh shit you're right i didn't even think about it that way i'm just thinking well she's an artist this is what she does and Maybe it's good that she can like develop some kind of perspective on this. And I just love that her her argument is it's a neutral view of the accident. It's not about him. I actually believe her when she says that, but I know there might be people who think it's a passive aggressive punch. I th yeah. yeah, I mean just judging by her response to Joan in that scene that I mentioned where she's like, How how's your relationship with your son? And she's like, Oh, you know, like, you know, just not actually acknowledging it. I think that she's in denial 
about a lot of things, obviously. And I think that just based on the how the movie opens of just how it's sort of like whatever this uh, higher power is that's playing God with these with these miniatures in this house, I think that her cre- recreating the scene is her way of kind of like taking back some semblance of control over her life. Um, mm. And that's why, you know, probably her destroying her entire like thing that she's building is is symbolic of her completely losing control obviously um right. so that's you know her to, to create the recreate the accident was was therapeutic actually i think i don't think it was like oh it's just i'm just trying to like get whatever the line was a neutral view. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> well, I mean, she, I, I drew a parallel between that and her, the way she told the story about the paint thinner and the matches with the kids waking up and they're all covered in paint thinner and she's holding a lit match. And she's like, and I immediately put it out because of course I did. You know, like she's got this attitude, like, because I would never do anything like that. And it's like, but, yeah. you, but well, you did. I mean, you can understand where your kids are coming from. They're terrified. Yeah. She's like, but I never, and no matter what I said, they would never believe me. And I'm just like, okay, so she's, maybe, maybe she there are things that even Annie so isn't. She beautifully too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did. But maybe there are things that even Annie isn't willing to admit to herself mm-hmm. about like her own uh, complex feelings. Like, I don't think she hates either of her children but i think there is this maybe it's also just like an attempt to again like you're saying wrench control from her mother at that point because if she destroys her children and herself then her mother loses control of all of them and maybe that's the only way she could see in that sleepwalking like subconscious state a way to just escape her mother yeah. and and have her children and so this act of destruction is actually an act of protection maybe in her subconscious mind's eye. I don't know. It's so complex. Maybe like, it's like I said, I her it subconscious or maybe it's like the, it's the powers that be who are like, you know, there's this like war being waged uh, in, in the, the netherworlds where they're just like, King Payman is, is almost on earth. We need to send our powers to make, Annie sleepwalk and you know burn <laughs> burn Peter to, to death with paint thinner um, and a mask. So he won't feel safe with her. Maybe they were trying to get him not to feel safe with her, so he wouldn't trust her later. Well, See, I, there's so many well, possibilities. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Re- regardless of what it is, they, they are all pawns. They are all little miniatures in this yeah. this large simulation of uh, of life. Yeah, and. To go back to like them being pawns and it, it all being orchestrated and their fate is sealed, like again the genius of Ari like foreshadowing. I don't know how um, much you guys have noticed the the uh, symbol for the the cults. Oh that's, yeah, it's like yeah. sprinkled throughout. Like I mean, it's pretty heavy handed, but even like on the pole itself, they drive past it before. Yes. Um, and like first time viewing. You're, I, I mean, I, I caught that there's a symbol and then we held up on the, the light pole post, but I didn't know why, you know what I mean? And then obviously you, later on you find out why. But yeah, it just, I don't know. I don't know what my point could, is, but I agree. Could you just imagine like there's all these like old ladies who are, you know, in the middle of the night, they're like dragging a dead deer into the, the road. They're painting like the symbol on the, on the pole. And they're naked the entire time too. They're not doing it. <laughs> See, and someone Zach they're waiting until that. like the, the the Grams are not at home, and they're like taking all these like decapitated corpses and putting them up in the attic and just you know painting shit on the walls. They're just like, we gotta hurry. They're gonna be home any second. Yeah, no. To that point, uh, Zach, there there is a moment when the family gets home, and the camera the cut starts before they enter the house, and you can actually hear cult members upstairs in the attic you can hear their footprints their foot uh foot sounds so there's little details like that throughout Mm. or when um when uh peter's smoking in his room and he blows the smoke out the window off camera you can see someone's breath um in the cold that someone's watching him yes Uh, there's little things like that throughout um but yeah. yeah But I do love Zach always has that other movie playing in his head, like he does for like the Scream movies and like the behind the scenes of the we villain. Needed the, the, <laughs> right. the, as I like to call it, the wild things and credits where we yes. see everything right. 
um, well, Joan I, is I, kind I, of like well, who's the character in Rosemary's Baby? Like the the neighbor. The neighbor. Oh, Ruth Ruth Gordon's mm-hmm. role. I don't remember her character's name because I haven't yeah. seen Rosemary's Baby in a minute. But Ruth yeah. Gordon played her. I know that. I know yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, because <laughs> she's basically <laughs> that character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we would. It would just. It she all. Is. It would all be like a Wild Thing style like ending, and it would. It would start from like <laughs> the peak. It would. It would literally start from like the grandmother just being like, "All right, now like you're gonna kill me," and then when we see that, and then like every little aspect of the, <laughs> the, the plan afterwards. Um, in another movie, I mean, it would totally like fuck up the tone but in any other movie it would have <laughs> Man, this is why like they should film this stuff for deleted scenes on the blu-rays like give us give us like <laughs> bonus features that we can really sink our teeth into <laughs> but i feel like it gives it it naturally has an air of satire if you just kind of pan the camera away from the family fighting and you just kind of see old people just kind of like <laughs> you know or something i don't know i just love how that's where zach's mind goes i love it so i know so when terrible. when you make your movie zach or when we make your movie you're we're gonna make sure that we get those scenes in the can okay, yes <laughs> that gonna, will be the whole movie there won't be like an yeah. <laughs> just like, actually you just know the what? old naked Let's do people it, cause that... like just standing around and like <laughs> just like excellence you know as they as they plot. it'll be it, it, yeah. it'll be very behind the mask the rise of leslie vernon that's that's more kind of like along the lines of I think where Zach's mind goes mm-hmm. in terms of like let's follow. It's been a it's been the, a minute since time. I've seen it. So. Oh, you should see it again. Yeah. I, it's right up your alley. <laughs> they talk about all of this. I have a question for both of you before I forget. Yeah. When you guys first watched it, do you remember? Um, there's a there's an edit that sticks out mm-hmm. in the film where it cuts from. They do it twice, I believe. They do it from um, night to day, and then oh yeah day to night it's a mm-hmm. exterior shot of the house yes um the second one where it goes day to night did you guys notice all the cult people around the house when it cuts to nighttime no no it's very yeah. subtle i'm terrified yeah I'm that's terrified. one of the one of the uh, moments where it's like oh fuck um, oh, girl. and when i first watched it i did not notice it but on repeat viewings, they're there and they're very visible. So I'll be oh sure to I'll God. be sure to include that on the video pod. I, th- I think I've only yeah. seen it about four times now because I, I I knew when I bought it. I'm like I don't want to overwatch this because I don't want to get used to it. Um, I kind of liked feeling the trauma every time. But actually, this most recent screening was the least traumatic for me. I think I feel like there was a little bit more room for. I don't know about levity, but room for just other things. Like the trauma's there, but it's also th- there's so, there's so much to this. It's so dense um, with things that you can y- use to occupy your focus that you don't just have to sit there and be re-traumatized all over again. There's so much more yeah. going on, and even if you just want to lean back into like the beautiful aesthetic of the film, because films that are this brutal, emotion on an emotional or psychological level aren't usually this beautiful to behold in terms of the way Ari Aster and his team frames shots and executes them and it's I mean I could turn the sound off and just go <sighs> I mean except oh for no the, you need the, the sound head no you do <laughs> but I mean I, I'm just saying like if I <laughs> if I wanted to have maybe the 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 co- most calm experience I'd probably have to like you know shut my eyes when they expose the decapitated head you know or cutting into the when pigeon. tony when tony collette's doing that <laughs> thing with her neck well i think like, most of that is the that's... sound design it's like you know like just seeing it as it is oh but her comical. face her face too yeah. though like oh god the... Love it. oh so god good. It's and the so, score we have so to good. we have to mention the score the score is really good oh yeah very good I... Very uh, full of dread and like just unnerving. Just like a lot yeah. of low hums and, mm-hmm. and there was there's something else that we we saw recently. I forget what it was. It was similar to that. Do you remember which movie we covered? We've covered so many. Zach. Ooh, this God. is episode seventy one. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> I remember uh, it you was, mentioning it. It was recent. Yeah. Um, Here, let me just turn back in my notes and see if I can find it. It wasn't prom night, well, was it? <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. Maybe. Um, might have been. 
well, Freddy's I'll, Revenge, I'll, maybe? <laughs> no. Um, well, I'll just say that um, I think the, the thing with this movie um, it's just like because I don't know if it's missing anything per se, like 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 what you said, but it's it reaches such a crescendo early on by the end of the first act that it's sort of like not that it necessarily peaks, but there's definitely issues in the second act where I found it just the story kind of meandered a little bit, um, and we saw a lot of the same repetitive beats happen over and over again and of course like just because the movie is so stunning and because you have tony collette's amazing performance that it's nothing's like takes you completely out of it but even watching it um uh this morning actually um i i was so engrossed in the movie for probably the first half and then it got to a point and i'm like eh, i'm gonna check my phone um and i consciously did not want to check my phone at the beginning, but it got to a point. Um, I don't know if it was like the uh, like the second time she ran into um, to Joan or, sure. or something. I'm just like, okay, you know, I I, I I know what's going on here. I don't need to like pay attention to this. That I, what's the runtime on this? Because I not it's that two I two hours. hours and nine minutes. I think I didn't. It didn't. It didn't feel long at any point at all. But there's no, no, there's no, 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 there was no. there was like some lags and lulls. Uh, in in the middle, two hours and seven minutes, but, and that um, seven minutes is probably credits. So, yeah, yeah. probably. It hit the sweet I mean, spot. I mean, I, I again because so much of it is occupied by people just kind of like uh, moving buoyantly within their grief. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you. I, I don't I, I, I if there was something to like shave off of or cut or anything like that I wouldn't know where to start I, I'm kind of grateful for the rhythm of it um so I, yeah I don't know I, I um, I'm the wrong person to ask yeah <laughs> for yeah. Like t- hard criticisms of this movie because I, I kind of en- enjoy it exactly as it is and I can't imagine it being altered without me having a lot to say about what we're missing because we shaved that out you know what i mean yeah that's fair i was gonna say i i would would have to watch it again with that in mind of like oh what am i gonna cut because when i watch it i i don't think about that which is like which is a good thing you know because usually usually i'm like that we could have done without that scene right right. (laughs) and for here here i nothing comes to mind but if I, i i'm sure i could find something if i watch it with that in mind um but yeah, I think just the fact that like this, you are an editor and, you know, mm-hmm. you, you already yeah. spoke at the top of the episode about how these are, you know, things that you're naturally cognizant of. So if like that's something that doesn't register with you, then that's probably, you know, means that it's a perfect movie yeah. in your eyes. Mm-hmm. So, well, yeah, close to it. And I mean, the overall, like I like we like we said, like just the cinematography, the sound design, the music, the acting, everything. And then also, you know, the editing oftentimes goes unnoticed for the casual viewer, sure. but that's usually a good thing, you know, because it's right. it's the invisible crew member of the mm-hmm. production. Um, but for me, when I'm looking at things like that, like there's a lot of cool cuts and edits in this film that are deliberate, yeah. you know, that are on purpose and that I appreciate as well. So just this discussion has blown my mind. I feel... <laughs> I, I I feel more rearranged than I did when I watched the movie for this screening. But <laughs> I definitely now it's like well now now there's all this new stuff I have to watch for the next time I screen it. Yeah, oh. yeah I def I definitely have like even because I I appreciate this movie and I really love it. But now I have an even like greater appreciation like after hearing Andre just mention all oh. of the. The little Easter eggs, if you will, mm-hmm. um, and there's so much more online. I, those are the ones I could remember. Like, there's sure. so much more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited to watch it again. I don't. Um, and I'm, who knows? Maybe it'll be soon. I like this. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is a good conversation. <laughs> uh, anyone else have uh, something you want to add before we get to the cherry picker? The, the just the last thing uh, that I remember uh, it was one more thing that I did, didn't really understand the first time I saw the movie and it, it hit me over the head with the first question of the movie for me I think this time 
it was Charlie laying there after uh, Ellen's uh, funeral and everything, her burial. And she just says, who's going to take care of me? And Annie's just kind of like, well, I am. And, you know, your brother and, you know, daddy and everybody is just going to. But, but when you die, I'm just like, oh, my God. So wait. She could just be like saying it like this could just be like the writing just being kind of like, that's going to happen. <laughs> She's right to be worried. <laughs> but also, it made me wonder if there's some level that Payman or Charlie is prescient um, of what's coming in a in an abstract way not like because there's this cult of old people who don't wear any clothes and they smile at me in the dark and they're <laughs> gonna kill you and then who's gonna take care of me because i don't really feel safe with it i don't think it's that yeah. cognizant but i think it's maybe more like I, I, you know what i'd really like to know because charlie's an artist uh i'd really love to know what does charlie dream about that's a question i would love to have answered i i, I bet there could be a whole graphic novel just the dreams of charlie pre payment anyway i think that, that they that, i think charlie would just be dreaming about or like king payment stuff because it's because it is payment how do you guys think you'd react if at a young age somebody told you you were payment <laughs> and now we're going to <laughs> worship you like you are the, one of the eight kings of hell how do you think you would have handled that I think that, um, well, are we saying that if like one of our parentals told us this or just like some yeah, random but also, person? But also, but also then there's these people, like there's a lot of people around yeah. you telling you this is the way it is and this is who you are. What do you think you would have done with that? I mean, I have always, I thought that, I mean, I've been told um, that I wasn't a very talkative child. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. Uh, at one point, so maybe I would easily be led astray uh, that way of just like <laughs> any anyone could like easily coerce me into thinking a certain way. But I, I think like now if someone told me this shit, I'd be like talking to everyone. I'd be like, so <laughs> the, the, the nice old lady who doesn't wear clothes down the street told me and they're just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I You're don't like know. I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's hard to say because I like the time that we're children, and you know, especially like like younger, like like younger than five. I have yeah. no recollection of that time in my life. Um, I think like my earliest memories are probably eight years old. Oh wow, seven or eight. I don't I don't remember anything before that. Wow. Okay. I have flashes. Is that bad? <laughs> you are both like. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I, I, stuff when I was three. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. I. I. My sister was born when I was three, and I still have some very vivid memories of particularly the day of her birth, and I have maybe a handful of memories prior to her being born, but. Uh, well, knowing oh, yeah. you, you probably wrote everything down in like an itemized list, and you know that's how you <laughs> remember. It. No, I was an artist. I drew like like Charlie. But no. uh, what about you, Andre? About what? <laughs> if you were payment, what would you? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I like to believe that if adults were telling me that, that I would just go with it because <laughs> I I was very I trusted most adults. At, at a young age and you know i did what i was told i was a, a very mm. obedient a, obedient kid so if they were convincing me that that was the truth i would just probably go along with it i don't know yeah it's hard it's hard to say that's a very interesting question yeah, yeah. i i think i would be a terrible <laughs> payment because i would not like adhere to any of the <laughs> rules or responsibilities at all i'd be like fuck that i don't want to do that that sounds yeah. like a lot of work but be like, whose idea was it that I'm the god of mischief? I mean, come on, people. I mean, no obviously, <laughs> but, you know, like, I don't want to, I, I just want the title. I don't want any of the responsibilities. That'd be a good username, <laughs> Zach. Terrible payment. Terrible. Or a good band, a good band name. Yeah. That'll be our band. <laughs> Terrible payment. <laughs> I'll play the tambourine. But, uh... <laughs> I'll play the triangle. Yeah, I think I I I think I'm, I'll uh, sing. I, I... <laughs> Yay! 
Uh, we're gonna be uh, just some per- so the simplest percussive instruments, Andre and I and Zach just singing with a triangle and a tambourine in the background. Oh Tickets my god! On sale. We'll have somebody lay like some some sick beats, like yeah. some synth tracks, you know, just so there's something else going on. Anyway, but no, the reason I ask is I'm I'm intrigued by your answers because I feel kind of the same way. I think I would have. I, I actually I worry about myself. I think it, given too much power at too young an age, I think I would have just ate it up. Just been like, well, it's about time, and then the monster would have come out. Like I'm a very all or nothing person. A lot of I always knew I was a diva. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now I just have people confirming what I already knew. So why aren't if I if I if I understand our roles correctly? You should be fetching me something to drink, and I should be drinking it. So, come on, hop to. I'm King Payman. We're, we're just a, a bunch of divas here. <laughs> just a anyway, bunch of terrible yeah, payments. <laughs> the terrible payments. I love that. Oh my god, for each for our own individual reasons. So yeah, that's all I had to say. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, without further ado. Let's get to the cherry picker. It's not like we killed people. On purpose. So, who are we thinking for the cherry on top? I mean... And the Oscar goes to... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... I mean, it's a tight cast, yeah. but come on. Come it's like, on. hey, Tony, so sorry you didn't get an Oscar, but you got a cherry on top. Yay! I love it. We should we should find a a, a name for the award, a cherry on what what's the a cherry good on name top? For the cherry on top. Award? No, no, no. But I mean, like you know how they like the Academy Awards are also called the Oscars, and the Antoinette Perry Awards are called the Tonys. Like, what is it what called? Name? The Mar- Maraschino, Mar- Maraschino, Maraschino, uh, the the Maraschino, okay. a Maraschino. She know. she won the Maraschino <laughs> this week. I feel like there's too many syllables in that, though. Yeah. That's, that's probably <laughs> <That> is... <laughs> true. We may as well just say, yeah, cher- cherry on top. Cherry, cherry on C-O-T. top is four syllables. Maraschino is four syllables. Yeah, it should be less syllables. Yeah. Uh, we'll figure it out. Write, write in with no, your suggestions, we won't. folks. You... <laughs> Homework assignment for you. I don't even care. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going as we've been going. <laughs> All right. Obviously, it's Tony Collette. It's Annie. Obvi, yeah. Um, all right, <laughs> great. Now, we have a, a little business to take care of from last week because we asked you who deserves to die the most in Psycho 2. I nominated <laughs> Warren Toomey, uh, and you nominated yes. Emma Spool. And across Patreon, Instagram, and YouTube, the vote came to 381 for Toomey versus 196 mm-hmm. for Spool. Thanks for trying, guys. <laughs> <laughs> your your responses to that are always they always give me life. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> we tried, we tried. But <laughs> thanks. Let's thanks let's up. let's see what the people think. Amethyst Frost. It's Warren for me, but in Eddie's defense, I think it's much easier to make a case for Emma Spool than for Tree's mom, as he had expressed Emma being a similar choice. I concur with Kirby and Mindy that this movie is underrated, but the twist with Norma not being Norman's biological mother is the one part that loses me a bit. So I wasn't mad that Norman mm. clobbered Spool with that shovel, but Toomey still sucked. And it's a bit surprising that the movie shies away from showing his death beyond a slit on the cheek, whereas Lila, the final girl of the previous movie, gets an entire knife through her head <laughs> and we see every frame of it. Toomey should have died harder. Uh, it was still early in the movie, but okay, sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be yeah. mad if there were more gruesome deaths. Wasn't that I'm actor sure. in what, a Die Hard movie, too? Or my... Dennis Friends? Yeah. I don't know. You're asking. I thought maybe Amethyst Frost was like (laughs) punning, died harder, and I'm like. Oh, I don't. I I I doubt it. Okay. Andre, die hard, 
anything? No idea. Okay. No idea. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen the single <laughs> Die Hard says, Mr. Toomey is a male Karen of the 80s. <laughs> what? I guess like... A male Karen? Oh, it's your Karen, yeah. Um, I guess because he went into the diner and was just causing a scene. <laughs> okay. Huh. You could just call those Darren's. Or don't they call them something like Kevin? Kevin. 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 Okay. Yeah. This is kind of like the the Mary Sue to the Gary <laughs> Stew <laughs> argument. Gary Stew. Yeah. Uh, uh, Grant Dempsey. To me, for sure. Uh, poor Mrs. Spool. How dare you say nominating her is a true? Oh. Uh, sorry. Go on. <laughs> How dare you say nominating her is a tree's mom moment? Eddie Tree's mom nearly killed her own daughter for a bit of <laughs> birthday party fun. Mrs. Spool wasn't well and was still trying, still just trying to take care of her dear sweet boy. Don't compare Mrs. Spool to the monstrous cake face killer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wish Lila like, had been nominated points. though. I understand her motivation, but even so, what she did throughout the movie was damn cruel. Psycho 2 could have been just a bittersweet epilogue to the original if it hadn't been for her. It was, but Lila's death was brutal enough. It was fine. I was satisfied, and I love her in the movie, so I didn't want to kill her. I liked seeing her killed, but I didn't want to kill her. I love that Tree's mom is just the gift that keeps on giving. That's it's just, <laughs> so iconic. It's such so a iconic. controversial. Like it's, uh, I'm never gonna live it down, and I'm glad that uh, <laughs> nobody else is either. Um, I just love that the, the the vitriol still in favor of Tree's mom <laughs> being killed, but not <laughs> not Emma Spool. I think that's hilarious. I don't mm-hmm. agree, but I think it's hilarious. Desiree Perez I'm a have to go with Mrs. Spool because she's the reason why Norman goes back to the way he was she was fucking with his head mm. and killed people to make it look like Norman's killing again mm. ESP 16 uh, Mr. Toomey Woomy Boomy Hoomy Future Boy <laughs> huge psycho stan here so glad you guys are covering these underrated sequels Toomey is a mustache twirling Douche for sure, but my vote goes to Mrs. Spool. She turns poor recovering Norman uh, mental again and kills lots of innocent people in the process, then drops the bomb about her being Norman's real mother, a plot device that I was never really a fan of, so glad this is addressed in part three. Also, she drank the damn Mm -hmm. tea knowing that Norman had history of spiking it. Right! Uh, She deserves to be taxidermized. Long time listener, first time caller. Hello. Love this franchise and you both. Keep up the good work. Thank you, future. Thank you. Uh, Silent Saturn, Emma Spool. Jeez, vocal minority here. Uh, Emma Spool, simply for the wasted opportunity to give us an iconic character, an epper. Iconic character and epic killer reveal. I mean, what we get is, so I'm your real mother. I killed those people. Yes, I'd love some sugar in my tea. Bam! She's dead. Uh, oh, wait, there's more. What is what is that? There's no conclusion to a so far pretty decent horror sequel. Camp that shit up. Have, a, have mousy little Mrs. Spool come in, suddenly wearing lipstick, her hair down on one shoulder, her coat slipping, exposing the other. She sits down one leg out and goes like, Norman, honey, be a dear and fix mommy some bourbon. Light cigarette. You have to understand, back in the day, a girl as young and pretty as I was. The men in this town couldn't handle it. They had to lock me away. My jealous sister, always wanting what's mine, took you from my arms, claiming you as her own. You know, Norman, I was an innocent. I was an innocent and they ripped and tore at me until... Pause for dramatic effect. Until I wasn't anymore. And scene. (laughs) Something like that. I don't know. Oh my god. Oh. Exquisitely written. Exquisitely performed. (laughs) That was was all Silent Saturn. Who wrote that? Silent Saturn. Work. Thank you, Silent Saturn. (laughs) Not so silent anymore. Um, and then, uh, <sighs> De- P- Deplius, Mrs. Spool, more like Mrs. Fool, 
<laughs> That's it. <laughs> Maybe we should have led with that one. Um, That's hilarious. Yeah. All right. So as uh, is the tradition with having uh, our guest, yeah. Mr. Andre Felix, you get uh, the first vote. Wow. Thank first you. nomination. That's a relief. Yeah. That's a relief because I feel like the choices are limited here, and I fumbled yeah. the bag in Scream Six. I really thought I was onto something, <laughs> 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 and boy was I wrong. So hopefully this redeems myself a little bit. Um, I'm just gonna say Joan because she's like the master manipulator um, in this whole situation. And hopefully I don't fuck it up this time. So yeah, Joan's my pick for Joan. who deserves to die the most in Hereditary. Yeah, Joan is a good pick. I'm going to go for, and I looked up the rules just to make sure that this was allowed. Um, I'm going to go for Ellen Lee, grandmother, okay. uh, because she's really the, the, the catalyst of all this. Um, uh, and just seemed like a horrible person and made her daughter's life uh, miserable and killed her husband allegedly and uh, caused her son to hang himself and etc. Um, so fuck that bitch. She can uh, she can burn in. Uh, well, I guess she might like that. She she can go straight to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should have revisited the rules because I didn't know <laughs> she was. <an> <laughs> So maybe I fumbled the bag again. Uh-oh. Well, only one way to find out. Um, and because pickings are so slim, I'm just going to go with probably a controversial choice. No, as usual. <laughs> Here we go. But, he- but hear me out. Um, I'm going to pick Charlie because this is the thing. Without an actual payment existing in Charlie, that the way that we know uh, that that they are, um, Annie's mom, Ellen, is just kind of like a batshit woman. But because there is an actual payment, she can actually do some serious damage, and she does, and payment does, and and will continue like everything that we hear in that last speech about what the world is going to be like and how payment's going to endow the, the, the cult basically with the ability to, what I don't remember what it is to, but to like manipulate us to like have us, you know, kind of like bend to their will or whatever. Like that doesn't sound fun. So, um, and without payment, like all of that shit is just a bunch of naked, crazy people, you know, around a house. So, uh, it's, I wonder if people are just going to see it and think like I kind of let my Freudian slip go earlier with just like sweet Charlie. I hope people can see Charlie for the payment that they are. But uh, yeah, that's my choice. So Charlie. 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 (laughs) You just, you just gave me another thought of just like headcanon of like after the credits roll and everything is said and done. And then the, this, uh, payment cult no. comes out and they're just like we rule the world now and everyone's just like who are you and they're just like we're the from the seventh rung of hell or blah 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 and it just makes me think of like the the, the speech in Buffy that we just covered in uh, in season five when she's talking to the Watchers Council and it's just like there's not really much you can do with the information you have other than publish it in the we're crazy home journal <laughs> so I just feel like <laughs> The payment cult, they're just, like, ready to, like, take over the world. And everyone is just like, oh, that's nice. We've got a pandemic that we're dealing with right now. So <laughs> you're going to have so to get you might wanna, Yeah, you might want to, you know. Put some clothes co- on. <laughs> cover up because there's a chill in the air. It's going to be a cold winter. And yeah. You don't want to be sick. You don't want to yeah. get a cough in this climate. Believe us. Uh, <laughs> hereditary oh, too. <laughs> oh god hereditary too. what's next yeah. but, um, <laughs> all right whatever well, payment <laughs> <laughs> those are your nominations you can vote for oh. joan you can vote for ellen or you can vote for charlie and uh the <laughs> poll will be available on instagram <laughs> at the cherry picker pod 
It mm-hmm. is also available on the YouTube channel, The Cherry Picker. So if you are new to The Cherry Picker and you are listening to this, go watch us on video and subscribe to the channel there. And if you are watching us on YouTube, you can go down to the descriptions and find the RSS feed link and you can listen to us. Uh, so so neat how that works. Uh, also, if you're supporting on Patreon, if you're supporting my Patreon account, you uh, will also get to vote on there and you'll get early access to all of our episodes. And you'll also, depending on what tier you're at, get access to our bonus episode, The Cherry Picker After Dark, uh, where this month we are covering Cruel Intentions. Mm-hmm. So the, very excited for I just, that. <laughs> I just keep seeing Mia Kirshner on the floor holding on to Chris Evans' leg as he's like pulling her. She's like, do you want my help or not? In Not Another Teen Movie when they satirize Cruel Intentions. <laughs> do we have to watch Not Another Teen Movie as well? <gasps> I totally will. So just to fun. watch well, it. Well, I'm, cause... I mean, because already I'm feeling like, okay, <laughs> Cruel Intentions, Cruel Intentions 2, Cruel Intentions 3, the Cruel Intentions I tell you to do that. pilot. I know, but I'm a completionist. The Cruel Intentions pilot with Sarah Michelle Gellar that, uh. that never was. Um, uh, Dangerous Liaisons, Felmont, and now not another teen movie. Okay, that's a lot to, uh, to take on. <laughs> there might that's even be something like else. season. That's more than season five of Buffy. That's pro- <laughs> probably just as many hours. I don't know. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, but anyway, yes. So so go over to Patreon and uh, support uh, the podcast over there. You'll also be supporting my main yeah. channel. And I do want to uh, welcome some new Patreon supporters. Mm. So uh, give it up for Michelle, Josh Carr, Tamika, and Grant Dempsey, who uh, actually commented just before this. So, Yay, so yes, everybody yes. welcome. Well, welcome. Yeah. And, and also a huge thank you to our editor, who could not be here today. <laughs> 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 Andre Felix. Is... <laughs> He's busy. <laughs> Slow clap. Wouldn't that be terrible if this were the way we gave you your walking papers? Just kind of like, thanks, Andre. So this is the last time. It's been nice. <laughs> it's been lovely. <laughs> Divas out. Yeah. <laughs> Divas. Um. <laughs> Andre, where uh, where can they find you on social media if uh, if they so choose to? They can find me on Instagram at Mr. Andre Felix. And that's it. <laughs> that is all. <laughs> uh, Edward? Oh, I'm tempted to say look for me everywhere, but I'm only on three platforms now. Uh, uh, the, the, the Instagram, the YouTube, and the Letterboxd. Uh, all Edward is truth. One word, traditional spelling. If you find an account that has that name on a twitter or a facebook it's not me so throw tomatoes report that shit yeah there you go yeah yeah like troll them (laughs) that's really i don't know if i should say that i have so many stands but anyway (laughs) what about you zach (laughs) thank you i couldn't even i couldn't even say it without laughing yeah uh i am on instagram (laughs) at retro bitch face i'm on twitter at zach cherry eight I'm on Letterboxd at Zach Cherry and my main YouTube channel, Zach Cherry, uh, which is Z A C K C H E E E one E R R Y. <laughs> and also, you can follow uh, the main the uh, oh I already said this, but the Instagram account at, at uh, the Cherry Picker Pod. I said it again anyway. <laughs> we don't we don't have an actual. Um, um, way of doing this so it's always just random at the end um, which which is always fun because then we somehow peter out and it's awkward but uh, <laughs> um, I also forgot that I have a litter box now too so Mr. Andre too late <laughs> <laughs> no no coverage next time <laughs> no new followers you get any new followers after this pod you delete them <laughs> What is, uh, what is I think you guys are the only people who are following me. It's Mr. Andre Felix. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you. It's just you two. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right. Um, 
Andre, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yes, oh, thank God. you for oh, yeah, having no. me. <laughs> thank you for letting me I pick hope you had a great the movie. Time. I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, and it's always if fun we do, to if you guys like, do, I am your mother. But if you do Ari Aster again, call me. Ooh. Absolutely. Well, you're, you're of course welcome back um, anytime, and, and and we'd be happy to receive you again, uh, and then release you when the time comes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sounds good. But but no, thank you, and 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 again, thank you for 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 being our editor because you do an awesome of job. Of course, uh, my pleasure. Edward, what is happening next week? It's Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most wow efficient. That and was succinct. the quickest. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening, <laughs> and we will be right back. <laughs>